Hello, everyone. Bonjour. Hello. Hello. Buenos dias. Guten Tag. My name is Marian Titters. I'm delighted to be the facilitator for today's webinar. I'm here to introduce our expert speakers, moderate some questions from you, our, our audience members, and ensure that the webinars progress according to the schedule so that we respect everyone's time. But first, on behalf of McMaster University, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth webinar of the series, The Arctic, A Global Health Perspective. We have participants from all over Ontario, Canada, and the globe online today, graduate students, faculty from McMaster and partner institutions in global health, as well as representatives from the World Health Organization, WHO, and some select invitees. Many of you are preparing to contribute your skills to Arctic Global Health. We welcome you all to today's compelling session. This webinar series explores diverse perspectives on Arctic Global Health. Despite documented health disparities between the circumpolar north and other regions, the Arctic remains an underrepresented area in global health research. This series offers a transdisciplinary look at key global health challenges and opportunities in the circumpolar north. A quick overview of the 10 webinars in our series can be found at the Global Health website. As I said, today's session is Webinar 4, Arctic Governance. It features Dr. Margarita Paula Poto, researcher at the Faculty of Law at the Arctic University in Norway. Time has been built in for questions and discussion at the end of the presentation. Please use the chat tool to submit questions electronically at any time during Dr. Poto's presentation. And note that while we may not be able to get to all of your questions, we will aim to address them afterwards on the Global Health website. This webinar series has been inaugurated by Dr. Andrea Bauman, the Associate Vice President of Global Health, who WHO, Collaborating Center in Primary Care Nursing, and the Health Human Resources, McMaster University. Andrea, will you please start us off with a few words about launching this webinar series? Thank you very much, uh, Miriam, and I'd like to thank uh, all on board uh, for today's webinar. Uh, for those of you who have followed us, as you know, this is the ongoing series, and we're very excited to have our second uh, guest speaker uh, from Norway. As you know, we, for those of you who have been with us, we introduced uh, our webinar with our colleagues from Norway, so it's nice to see uh, Dr. DePolo on uh, this morning. We began our discussion early morning to prepare for this session with Margarita telling us how she, uh, in her spare time, goes swimming in the ocean. <laughs> so we were discussing winter, and with Canada and Norway, we share that uh, common weather pattern. Although most of us don't swim in the ocean, so congratulations, uh, Dr. DePolo, for that. I want to thank everyone else uh, for coming. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And um, we will have, a, as Miriam says, we'll be uh, keeping the questions. And for those that we can't answer, we will answer on the Global Health website. So um, again, we look forward to this uh, Global Health Governance Lecture. And uh, thank you for joining us. And over to you, Miriam. Thanks so much, Dr. Bauman. As uh, Andrea was saying, today our guest speaker is Dr. Margarita Paola Poto, who was appointed professor at the University of Turin, Italy in 2019, and is currently a researcher at the Faculty of Law, UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, affiliated with the SECURE project. She's part of numerous research groups with interests spanning ocean governance, SAMI and indigenous law, and food security. Dr. Poto has collaborated with our Global Health Office at McMaster University since 2017 in the areas of Arctic governance, Indigenous law and methodology, and gender sensitive, sensitive research. As we were discussing, when not working, Margarita likes to swim in the ocean at any temperature. She also advocates for the environment. She says that after three months of yelling over the phone, she managed to ban plastic from the university cafeteria. However, recently, the plastic has been reappearing. So Margarita is recruiting a partner in crime to help her eradicate this plague. She says that person must be louder and more persistent than her. So if that sounds like you, 
go for it. Get a hold of Margarita. Dr. Poto, thank you for presenting for the next 30 minutes. I will provide a one-minute reminder, and then we can move into a discussion with the participants' questions that come up in the chat section. Over to you now. Thank you, Marian, for the beautiful presentation. And thank you, Andrea, for the invitation again, and all the beautiful people that have facilitated this. Um, Adam, Dina, Halina, Russia, thanks to everybody. Um, yes, so I am, uh, I was reflecting when I heard about the transdisciplinarity and the Arctic governance and health. And uh, I enjoy working with this beautiful team because it gives so much, uh, such a wider perspective to Arctic governance, wider than the legal perspective. So today you will hear the legal perspective from me. I can't totally abandon my uh, early career studies uh, in law, even though I have been expanding my legal, legal background and intersecting other disciplines. And I'm always a bit uh, hesitant to say that my research is interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, is not even clear to me. I know that I deal with different disciplines and not always in an ordered and disciplined way. So bear with me if I'm not uh, uh, using also an accurate language when I refer to other disciplines. I'm learning, uh, I'm on a learning path. So as you can see from the first slide, I am uh, also affiliated, and now it's a little portion of affiliation with the Norwegian Center of the Low the Seas, a research center based within the Faculty of Law at the UIT. And uh, so we, we are very concerned about the sea here, of course. And uh, when I, I think of the sea, as was mentioned before, I think of the ice as well. So here it's a perfect combination of this lack of boundaries between sea, water, rivers, lands, and ice. Here is a, is a unicum, unicum aspect. And we deal with different problems as interconnected, problems related to, to the sea, the ice, the land, and even the air. So um, here I am. I am. This is a bit above my, me. I'm sitting somewhere in one of the uh, illuminated houses uh, of the island of Trumso, and uh, I am on an island, an Arctic island, connected to the mainland Norway with a little bridge. And, uh, and I enjoy this landscape, again, of sacred mountains, um, of ice, of sea and rivers. And I have to say that this land is an indigenous land. So the island of Trumso and the county of Trumso has the origin, original name of Rumsa. So we are privileged inhabitants of a sacred Sami land. And uh, this is the typical way we would have enjoyed our class today if you were here, if we weren't probably in 2021. Uh, this is uh, the in inside of, an, of a traditional um, Sami construction. It reproduces and a traditional Sami construction. The real one is a tent. Here is made with wood and glass. And we are enjoying a dinner, should be reindeer soup, but we, the majority of us is vegetarian, so we are not really honoring the tradition. Um, and the amazing part of our classes or seminars is that they are lunch seminars. We enjoy conviviality when we have classes. And in, around this table you see people from all over the world. This is a very international university. 
Uh, you see a Maori researcher from the left, a Sami uh, scholar from Ethiopia working on Sami law, a scholar from Colombia working on traditional uh, law, myself, and one of the smartest students I ever met from McMaster University, Logan. So here he is to give you a little bit of glimpse of how interdisciplinarity works, how exchange of knowledge works. It is a very deconstructed in a way. It's a new way of relating to each other, where we learn from each other. We learn by eating the traditional food and becoming one thing. And that's, it's so real here. So I really hope that you can join us one day and me in the battle with plastic as well. Um, so what I'll, I'll do today, and I hope to keep track of the time really, is a very, very quick overview along an imaginary timeline of past and present and future. And forgive me if this, this timeline is still linear, I'm very much aware that time is not linear, it's just an illusion that is linear and it's probably a Western illusion that is linear, but I'll keep that one, that illusion for a little bit and then maybe we can challenge it at the end. And we'll see uh, what, how governance, how the concept of governance in law evolved or moved, I don't know if, if, if evolution is the right word, but moved from the past and it's a very far past, the 1648, throughout uh, the centuries and the well-known and maybe often overused expression of global, going global, globalization, gl the world as a global village. And we have a date, we can find a date for this uh, new coined expression in 1957 throughout environmental law today. And then we will look at what it means in the Arctic, what this evolution has developed in the Arctic and then see at the future. So the past and the present. This is the very sad, very funny, I don't know, uh, I don't know whether I have to cry or to laugh when I, every time I, I project this picture. This is a very iconic representation of international law, of what international law is and where it took origin from and and also of the seeds of what governance is today in a way. The seeds that have changed a bit, but it's the, some of them are still there. And um, we can go back to 1648, to the Westphalia peace, where some countries decided to go around a, a table to sign a treaty. And they decided to limit their own sovereignty and bound themselves to the treaty. So it was a very flat kind of decision making, flat in the sense that around the table, some countries, and here we have Spain and the Netherlands, and look at the representatives of the countries. They are religious people, religious white men. Uh, but these are the origins of our international law today. An agreement inter nations between privileged nations and states. I always ask my students, and I know you can't answer, but I ask you anyways, and you can formulate a, your answer in your mind. Do you see a woman in this picture? The answer is yes, the Virgin Mary up there. <laughs> Um, praying for these souls probably. So it's a very unidirectional decision-making process of the destinies of, of the world as it was known that back then. And what is striking here is that these representatives of states are signing this treaty uh, with their Bibles in their hands 
uh, affirming the exclusive sovereignty over lands, people, and agents. So there is a clear hierarchy where somebody prevails on somebody else or on lands, on the environment. This was the past. And this past, oh, lasted three centuries and is still is still the matrix of international law today. But we had some kind of mobilization in nineteen fifty seven uh, thanks to the influence or the studies of communication sciences, we realized that the world was not flat. And of course, the realization came earlier on, but that our uh, interactions were not necessarily unidirectional of somebody exer exerting sovereignty over somebody else or something else, but rather we started thinking in terms of networks. The web was introduced as uh, McLuhan and then his disciple Federman say the world after 1957 entered in our homes. Before 1957 we already had TVs and we entered in, in the world. We imagined that we entered in the worlds of others, we watched others but we changed, we shifted our way of conceiving the relationship in a sense of a globe, in a sense, in, in a dimension that is not only the flat dimension of the, those people around that table. And, and this allowed the participation of many more actors, not only of those white men in the room, but potentially all the citizens of the global village could partake some part, partake the decisions, could take responsibility of their actions, could have access to the information, could have, um, could participate to decision making, could have access to courts. And this, I believe, started here, law doesn't have any merit in that. Law comes very late, joins very late. And this is my image of law. And normally, law is very boring, so we need coffee to wake up. <laughs> That's the first interpretation of this. But the other interpretation of this is an image I always use when I explain how governance, global governance works to my food law students. And I use it to you too, even though you're not into food necessarily. Um, so we realize that the world is much more complex than a flat table where a few decision makers decide they are sovereign over everything. And we realize that there are levels that interact with each other. How do we realize that the international community elaborates principles that are filtered through regional organizations? And through them, they reach each and every state, each and every individual. And this is more or less uh, how the metaphor of the filtered coffee works. So we work in a multi-layered system, in a, in a system where interactions, where there are interactions, where there is interference, where there is influence between different levels, where we can really change uh, the final product. We can decide to have a very good coffee if we put good water and we have good filters. And then what does going global beyond all this metaphor mean today in the Arctic? Um, we will look at Arctic governance very soon, but this anticipates a bit what I'm going to say for Arctic governance. It means many things. It means that this complex system where relationship matters more than space, where the coordinates at least of space and time have changed, right? Going global. 
and relationship really matters, we have a new arena where we have new actors that interact. So they are not only states that decide, but we have envir environmental non-governmental organizations. We have different fora, Peace Forum, one for them is the Arctic Council. We have agencies that are half private, half public. We have intergovernmental organizations, satellites to the main big uh, international organizations. We have civil societies and communities that participate. So we have a wider spectrum of actors if we compare ourselves to the 1648. And we have also common goals. We like them or not, we have an agenda to follow. The Agenda 2030, of course, is the United Nations agenda, but it's a wide document that includes many actors and many goals. Hmm? Uh, it's overambitious, we can think it's plenty of buzzwords, but still it's our commitment to a better future where no one is left behind. So no one is left behind probably is the motto of the agenda that you should take into account when thinking of the inclusion of very large platform of actors. We have blurry boundaries between the traditional division of, of sectors, of disciplines. Law interacts with food, interacts with health, interacts with development, uh, economic development, interacts with the environment. And here I, did, I use the image of, of the Northern Light to show that there is not a sharp division between different sectors. And, uh, and you see there, something I'll explain you later, there are actors that try to come together and all these little animals asking with question marks, come together to a co-production, co-integration, and co-evolution evolution of knowledge. So it's a complex system uh, where there is a plurality of actors, plurality of actions, and a lot of interactions between the two. We still have some kind of lessons from the past. We know honor our ancestors, no matter how narrow-minded they might appear in that picture. And and among the, the the principles that are still valid in the global arena, there is the need to observe the promise. So we we still come into negotiations, into agreements, into acts, and we still believe on the importance of the binding importance of a negotiation of an act, and that's the Pacta Conservanda that you see here. You, we still believe that customary law, that customs repeated over time with a conviction of their binding effects are valid. But we question how we can apply the principle of sovereignty if we can still apply it. And that's my question to you too. I want to reflect on it. Is sovereignty dead or is still very well alive? Um, what about cooperation? What about the same level of interaction? Interaction on the same level, what about the concept of development? Maybe also the innovative new concepts hide some contradictions. Do we really want to uh, force uh, the implementation of a sustainable development? Do we all embrace, all the actors agree on the fact that we are developing? And then we are here in the Arctic and uh, we are in, in the Arctic. The Arctic region is a vast region. You can see it from this picture up above. Unfortunately, I haven't found yet. I really invite the geographers out there to help me. I haven't found a real picture of the Arctic region that is not Western based. Uh, so, but it involves some states, some of those traditional states. Canada is one of them. Then we have Alaska, so the United States. We have Russia in the Arctic Circle. We have 
a little bit of Scandinavia, that the, the final tail of the bear of Scandinavia. We have Greenland within the Arctic Circle. We, so we have all those states and communities and lands and seas under this little umbrella coverage that is the Arctic. And I also want to you, you to reflect on these very briefly. I told you that there is no, there is continuation and no separation between land, sea, ice, water, and, and the air. The Arctic comes from Greek and means bear. And of course, it's the symbol of the Arctic is the polar bear that unifies all the dis, dis, different realms. But apparently, the Arctic was named Arctic because of the constellation, huh? of the bear constellation. Um, made, I don't know, Orsa Maggiore, and I don't know the English now, but <laughs> you can, you, you certainly have understood it. And and and. The bear was the symbol between different levels of uh, also spirituality, the connection between the underwater, the water and the below water, but also the connection between the different living beings, different seasons. Um, that is all part of the Arctic, and that's it's part of the Arctic story that is often not, not told because everybody starts from, at least the lawyers start from the international law telling you ab about the states that came around the table. But there are wonderful Arctic stories that contain legal principles that should be remembered and, and told. And uh, in the Arctic region, um, I use this crystal ball to depict uh, the wonderful world that I found in Arctic governance with the need to integrate this world with different viewpoints. And here you see this uh, image uh, that comes from, from Canada, west coast of Canada is just near the Arctic, but a bit below it, um, where land and sea interact. This is the, the picture of governance according to the indigenous peoples of west coast of Canada, where land and sea cannot be separated, where animals and human beings are the same, where there is a little treasure, this little boat you see, uh, that is knowledge co-created by humans and non-humans. So in the Arctic region I live, I want to see that the models of governance are perfectly integrated. The Western model with the Arctic model of governance. And then here you see an image that a friend of mine created for us for a project where you see the planet, the blue planet happily hugging people and and, and continents and seas. So another way to see sovereignty, totally different from the past. And then you see I have put here two, two slides of some steps towards this beautiful world of integration in the Arctic. One of the traditional conventional steps that is always, step that is always quoted is the Svalbard Treaty. This is the first time where the sovereignty of Norway was affirmed over the Svalbard Islands. So it's an Arctic treaty involving an Arctic state. We talk about sovereignty, so nothing new under the sun. We are still under the paradigm of 1648. But there is something, there is some light in this that leads to the present and future. And is, the light is in Article 2 where Norway has a duty to protect the environment. So it's not only exploiting and keeping a sovereignty over land and seas, but it's a duty to preserve, preserve, conserve, and reconstitute the environment. So the environment protection pushed towards, pushed the, the, the boundaries of sovereignty towards new horizons. And the second step is the OSPAR convention. And um, yes, 
The OSPAR Convention is uh, takes combines two different agreements: the agreement in Oakland in Paris, that the strange name of OSPAR, and again again we have states, so it's uh, the old paradigm again, but it's a step forward in the Arctic governance because here the states had made an effort to identify strategic areas. So they weren't simply pulling the cover from one to the other side of sovereignty of the lands, but were worried and concerned to protect and to do certain activities, which is protecting biodiversity, creating uh, an umbrella for the ecosystem to thrive. Uh, so they were, they are wor were, and are worried about environmental threats. They are not only concerned about their domination on the land. At least this is the optimistic way that the seed of light I see in the OSPAR Convention. But we had to wait until a few years afterwards, uh, and it's. It's a process that took many years to see the creation, the establishment of a forum, a peace forum, the Arctic Council, uh, that was established uh, at the end of the Cold War. I usually refer to the words of Gorbachev um, in Murmansk, at least this seems to be uh, the or original idea. Uh, at least it comes from this speech, the original idea of the Arctic Council. Um, and then, of course, you can interpret his words in many ways, but he was adamant in saying that there is need of peace in the Arctic region, and this peace can only be established through the engagement of the peoples of the Arctic, of the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. Uh, as you can see in uh, this is a search of 2015. In 2010, very few were aware even that there was an Arctic Council made of eight countries with Arctic regions. I, I, I imagine that none of them knew that there are not only states that are part of the Arctic Council, but also groups of peoples, of indigenous peoples. But let's hope that I'm wrong. Yes, and here you see the steps. So um, it was in the late 1987, the speech of Gorbachev, uh, non-state actors shall be engaged. And then it was a, the Arctic Council was established through different uh, strategies uh, and uh, came to life. And this is how it looks today. So it's compo it is composed by the Arctic states. But it is a new platform, a new regional platform, because it involves a, a permanent participants. You see this red part, the representative of indigenous peoples of these states. Hmm? And then we have observer groups. There is always a kind of fighting to get a seat as an observer. There is a, the race of China the race that kind of failed of, of the European Union to be part of the Arctic. Everybody wants, of course, a share in that. Uh, we want to believe only for good reasons, but of course the Arctic is also full of resources that uh, in the logic of the sovereignty of 1648 are still very uh, appealing to the states. But I want to only talk about good things and good promises and and a better future. And so I look at the future again as an integration, as a, if I look at Arctic governance, I want to think of a transparent forum where everybody has the right to participate here, the crystal ball, and where the heart is made of governance coming from the peoples of the Arctic. And uh, therefore, my understanding of governance in the Arctic is that in governance, I, I have different tools. I have principles that interact. I have this pluralistic platform of actors. I have the protection of human and environmental rights. And when I say environmental rights, it's not only rights of, of the humans towards the environment, it's rather the opposite. 
its rights of the environment to be protected and preserved. And then it's also a platform for community-based uh, areas, community-based research. So individuals and collectivities shall interact in this ideal good governance of the Arctic. And I'll finish with these two um, pictures. This is a picture that I was kindly allowed to, to use. Um, and it requires a little bit of background in a way. So when I arrived to the Arctic and I started studying the participation of non-state actors to environmental decisions, I started studying it with my Western lenses. I started studying it as a way, as a gentle concession of the states that allow the participation of non-states to the table. I, I started from the picture of Westphalia, if you know what I mean. Then progressively I realized that that was, was one phase, but didn't grant an effective participation of all the actors, especially because that was not the table set by those actors. They were invited, but what if they had a totally different understanding of governance, of international relations? What if international relations didn't exist at all? And I'm not saying something totally detached from reality. If you look at the Sami language, the indigenous language of, of the country I am currently, there is not a word, such a word as international in Sami, because there is not such a concept of international in such a country. So imagine those people invited to eat uh, at a table where the food that was served for them was not even food. So what I did, I tried to look at the other perspective to now I asked to be invited at their table, and I did so by receiving a training for, from indigenous scholars that showed me that there is an indigenous law, that there is an indigenous methodology that helps to explore the law and find the law in the stories, in indigenous stories. And I started to progressively detach from, or I don't know, depart um, from, from the legal uh, upbringing from the legal tools I had acquired and look from another perspective. And I've been doing so since quite a long now time, at least three, four years of immersion in the indigenous law and the indigenous methodology to discover to my surprise, but not totally surprised, that there are many common aspects between the Western laws and the indigenous laws the indigenous methodology and the Western methodologies. So in my opinion, approaching governance in a region where there is a highly high dense populated area with people that are original from that area, we have to start from their own toolbox to learn their own methods their own methodology, their own stories, their own laws. Only by doing so, only by leaving our comfort shores and moving to learn with them, we can fully grasp the, the meaning of participation and global governance. Dr. Poto, you have about one minute left. Yes, thank you. And I'm yeah. finished. This is the final image I want to share with you, and it's the image that you have seen before, and it's illustrated by a dear friend of mine. I'm working a lot with images and illustrations, exactly because there are, there are language gaps that need to be filled, and I find that pictures and images help to build bridges, and is the story of the search of knowledge. One day the creator asked uh, the spirit, Nanabuzu, where he could find knowledge and could preserve knowledge. Nanabuzu asked the animals, and the animals had no answers, were silent. And that's where the search started. And then you see all these little animals looking for knowledge, apparently not finding it. And then the mole with no sight at the end 
found the knowledge in the center of the heart, the heart and the earth. Thank you very much. The floor is now yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Poto, for a, a really um, expansive presentation that helps us get beyond our, our states and look at uh, a more inclusive idea about what governance is about in the Arctic. Thank you so much. Um, you had mentioned, uh, or I guess I should prompt people to ask questions through the chat first. Um, I know it's hard to think of questions when you're hearing a presentation, so take your time now and, and bring those up through the, the chat, and we'll ask Dr. Poto your questions. So the first question, you had mentioned uh, uh, Gorbachev, and uh, people would see uh, him as a leader in the past, and I'm wondering if you could say, in Arctic governance today, what does it mean to be a good leader? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your question. And uh, as it is difficult to formulate questions, you can imagine it's also difficult to formulate answers. Um, and of course, there are different levels I can answer your question. And because I'm, I'm also doubting whether leadership is the right word, right? I, I'm questioning each and every word whether. It's a co-leadership that we want to achieve, whether we still need leadership, and probably the, the good leader is the one that knows how to balance uh, a sort of uh, his own action, alone action, with the cooperation with others. And, and of course, then there is the obvious answer that it's also difficult to judge the leaders when they are in their leadership, right? It's, history always helps to find some kind of detachment. But I would say that leadership does not belong to one actor only. That's my answer to that question, but it's, it's rather a question. Does it? belong to a person only. Okay, thank you for that. Um, you showed us a picture where there was, uh, uh, in, in terms of gender, where there was one woman and it happened to be uh, uh, Mary there. Um, yeah. My Mary, yeah. I always say that is Mother Earth. <laughs> Mother Earth. <laughs> <Pachamama>. uh, <laughs> yeah. Can you can you comment on the um, uh, balance of gender in the Arctic Council as it exists today? And uh, what else needs to be done in terms of uh, uh, any changes in gender representation? Hmm. Thank you for the question. Um, I think that the most important thing is to retell stories, make an effort to change some parts of stories. And when I say so, I, I, I look at myself and, and my, my track somehow. And if I had to choose a handbook for my students, in the past I never wondered whether those books were written by men or women, I can tell you the majority were written by by men. So, but we can shift, and I'm not saying that we now have to only pick books written by women, but we can reflect on the fact that the story, history, has been told and made mainly by this man here, even though Mary was praying over them probably. Um, and, and looking at the Arctic Council today, I'm sure that if I address such a topic, of course, there'll be countries that will react more promptly. And I can certainly mention uh, Scandinavia. Scandinavia is very sensitive to gender, it's very open. And when I say Scandinavia, I, I mean Fennoscandia, so also the SAPMI 
uh, the representative of the Sami parliament is a woman. So there are nuances. But what I also want to say is that beyond these nuances, I'm sure that if you raise the issue of gender balance, you'll be very easily framed un under a certain label, like, oh, yes, you're a feminist, or yes, you belong to the gender research group, or this is not geopolitics, this is another branch of studies, please refer to the experts there. So this is the reply I often get when I encourage my colleagues to think in terms of gender balance. I always get the answer that well, we are talking about law here, <laughs> you know, so it's a lot, there's a lot to do. I can, but probably the first step is to start forgetting or erasing the boundaries between sectors, between, at least that's what I can do as a researcher thinking that a law issue is, involves always a gender issue. Hmm? Or, mm -hmm. a, a, an investigation of sovereignty, it's also an investigation on, on power relations and involves gender reflections. Mm -hmm. Okay. Don't forget the boundaries. <laughs> Okay, I think this uh, questioner was anticipating uh, your response and because uh, it builds nicely on what you were just talking about. So the question is, I'm wondering about how to strike a balance between the sovereignty of the indigenous population living in the Arctic. How does, and this is in quotation, meaningful participation look like for populations living in the Arctic? Mm -hmm. Um, I wish there was a, a an indigenous, and I know that word indigenous is also Western word, but an indigenous person here, because I'm sure that he, she or he would be struck by the word sovereignty. There's, there's such a thing of sovereignty mm -hmm. in our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So challenging, even you know, the foundation. And, and I conducted some research on environmental governance from the perspective of, of the indigenous peoples. And I can tell you there is nothing, nothing that even remotely resembles to sovereignty. There are examples of symbiotic relationship with, between communities and people between humans and non-humans, not even the separation sometimes uh, between humans and non-humans. And, and I, I make the example of the reindeer. The reindeer are part of, of, of the family, of the household, you know, as it, it is the land. Uh, so sovereignty is something so far. Mm -hmm. There's nobody that is up above somebody else. So. And, and there, of course, then it's difficult to answer the second part, meaningful participation. There's only meaningful participation. There's only participation in a place where there's no sovereignty, because there is equi-ordination, there's equality. There is really in full integration, and I'm not even sure if this is the right word. Um, there is the sense and feeling that of wholeness, of a whole. There's no separation. Mm -hmm. That's the meaningful participation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you give an example of something you've been involved in that would demonstrate what you just described? Yes. Oh, I give you the example of of the algae. <laughs> um, so, as you said, I've been involved in a project here, it's called Secure, and it's a project on food and health, so it's also very interesting for, for McMaster um, in the Arctic. And we are looking, there is a part of the project that is very like industry oriented, we are looking for marine resources that are um, uh, beneficial to health, and at the same time, they are meant to feed the 
population that is expected, at least was expected to grow. I don't know now with the new statistics, but still expected to grow. So how do we feed and hunger? How we, do we guarantee food security by guaranteeing health as well? So I'm working in this area and we are mapping the different marine resources that could help to achieve these goal, both goals. And we came across the algae, you see, algae, I think in English, but I can't abandon my Greek and Latin, I call them algae. Uh, but by the way, in Norwegian, they are called tang or tare, which means entangled and soft. Mm. And according to the indigenous traditional coastal people, the algae, tang or tare, are not weed, so they don't call them seaweed. That is English that came and colonized their minds. They are entangled with the environment. There are forests of algae that connect land and sea. And these algae are food for the people, are feed for the animals, have health properties. So there is a complete called integral ecology of the system where there's no separation, where there is meaningful participation to the ecosystem, right? And to the decision okay. within this ecosystem. Okay. That's a great example. Thank you for that. Thanks yeah. to you for inspiring it. I wouldn't have thought about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Chris Fergal in the second webinar also talked about food security in the Arctic. Um, and, and so this is really helpful to see uh, a different perspective of what's happening in Norway. Um, he was talking about uh, here in Canada. Um, now, in relation to global health, I'll, I'll take you back into your own area here, Margarita. How has interlaw, international law shaped the health issues for people in the Arctic. So how has international oh, law mm -hmm. shaped you suspected judgment or <laughs> very badly that <laughs> um is there influence that I, you've had? I would say that it's still very sectoral. So international law doesn't see health the way you say it. It probably sees health as a mainly human physiological issue, physic, physical huh? issue. And I'm, I'm, and it disciplines it under this umbrella only, a little umbrella of health is a human problem. We have to approach it as such. Um, very few, and they are starting now, but they are still seen as the hippie, you know, of of our century. See health as within the One Health concept. It's still very like under the magic of some spell, talking about One Health. International law doesn't talk about One Health. Doesn't see health of the ecosystem of human beings, mental and physical as one, right, in a holistic, and also the word holistic, I know is can be, for the lawyers here in the room, they might jump on their chair, but there is a lot of fear to abandon the scientific definitions when it comes to health, right? We are very faithful what is testable in a lab. But we know that science is not alone. We have traditional knowledge. We have other ways to see health. And, and unfortunately, to answer your question, I think that the approach that international law has towards health in the Arctic is still a very narrow, oriented approach, focus on the health of human beings, preferably white human beings. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, when I say so say non-indigenous, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the choice of words in itself is, uh, is critical to understanding 
the notion of uh, of health in the Arctic and how the law might assist with health issues and opportunities there. So it's, language is really critical here as well. Hi. Oh yes, law without a language is nothing, and um, and of course, language is another tool in the hands of sovereign powers, right? We decide mm -hmm. how we formulate our laws, what concepts mm -hmm. we want to put, yeah, right? Um, mm -hmm. And really, I could finish tomorrow, but there is a huge literature on, on indigenous views on uh, the earth as a living being. And of course, the health of the earth too. And they don't use this; it's not translatable with with what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. It's so yes, law uses language. It's a political <laughs> involves political choices to pick parts of the language, and then it kind of freezes and consolidates it, and and rigidly puts it there from 1648. Sovereignty is still there and it's so difficult. I'm not saying to eradicate, but at least to enrich with alternatives. So yes, Marian, you're absolutely right. <laughs> okay. I want to sneak in one last question before we start to wrap up, Margarita. Um, let's move to a little bit about climate change. Um, um, we know that climate change is impacting the Arctic region, um, and you've also mentioned sovereignty. Um, does international law need to adapt in order to address the challenges and opportunities that climate change brings? Hmm. You know, there is always this tension between adaptation and mitigation, and I haven't found a solution. So we always say that you can, on the one side, you have to try to mitigate the effects of climate change. On the other side, you have to kind of accept the irreversible effects of climate change and adapt to them. So, and and these two elements, this tension is present in in the words, the bubbly, buzzy, wordy international law. So uh, if we want to to look at the bright side of it, of course, they are trying to do both. They are trying to uh, acknowledge that there is a change and adapt to it or at least promote the, uh, an adaptive attitude towards it, but also to mitigate. Um, whether it will be successful, honestly, I don't think that either of the strategies will be successful. I think that I always think that the planet has enough wisdom and that it will survive us, uh, regardless of how we qualify our actions and how good we feel when we <laughs> adapt or or mitigate. Mm -hmm. Yes. So mm -hmm. the solution is not in our hands. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, those responses to, and, and I want to thank everybody for submitting your compelling questions. As you can see, uh, Dr. Poto has really um, enjoyed responding to them, uh, um, and, and uh, it's been really helpful the way your presentation framed and set us up to ask those questions. So thank you so much for your um, expansive presentation on global health in the Arctic. I want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar, and uh, uh, again, a special grazie to you, Margarita, for such uh, oh, insights, especially in the Q&A, that's hard to do. We look forward to hosting the fifth webinar entitled Country, Food, Security and Safety in the Canadian Arctic, and that will be held on Monday, March the 8th from 10 to 11 Eastern Standard Time. It features Dr. Emily Jenkins, professor and acting head of the Department of Veterinary Bio Microbiology at the University of Saskatchewan here in Canada. So thank you again, Dr. Poto. Thank you everyone for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to your participation in our, our next uh, exciting webinar. So thank you, merci and gracias.